have you ever seen one of these little helicopter toys that you give them a spin and the thing just oh, flies away? I loved these things growing up, so I got my kids some, although I think I played with them more than my kids did, which got me wondering how high could you make one of these things actually go? And being a competitive male with access to CNC machines, I took that idea way too far, making basically the Formula One version of one of these helicopters. It looks pretty different, but it works the same way. You spin it up and let her rip. Although, spoiler alert, I did not find out how high you can make one of these go because I made a gigantic design error with this thing. Let's just say it's really good at uncontrolled flight into terrain. Oh my gosh. But even though I didn't achieve my goal, it's still a really cool helicopter, chock full of cool mechanics, interesting physics, and egregious design errors. So join me as we see how far we can push a cheap novelty made for children. These helicopters are really simple. You spin them between your hands, which stores up kinetic energy in the propeller, which blows air downwards, generating thrust, and they fly up. And obviously if you spin them faster, they're gonna go higher, but there's actually a pretty firm limit to how fast you can spin these things. If you think about the tip of the propeller spinning around, it's tracing out a circle really fast. And if you spin it fast enough, you can make it go supersonic, which would make a sonic boom, which is super cool but it also makes an enormous amount of drag and the propeller kind of stops working at that point. But even if you spin it below that limit, it doesn't do nearly as well, at least as I would have thought, because air drag increases like this. Spinning 10 times faster is about 100 times the drag. Think about it this way. The spinning propeller has a certain amount of energy, like a gas tank, which it can use to go up or to fight air drag. Spinning it faster gives it more fuel, but it ends up spending 99% of that fighting air drag so what if we ran the propeller a lot slower, where it's gonna be more efficient because it's not fighting air resistance, and instead we spin a flywheel really fast. The propeller would be spending a lot less energy overcoming air drag, but it would also have a lot less energy stored in it. But we'd make up for this with a fast spinning flywheel, which lets us store a lot of energy without all the air drag of a propeller. I ran some simulations of a fairly slow propeller, a propeller at the supersonic limit, and then a propeller augmented with a flywheel, which does this. It should be able to go about five times higher. But there is a really big problem with this design that we're gonna have to solve. We're gonna have a big propeller with a flywheel attached to it, which is basically a chunk of steel. If it goes way up into the sky, it's gonna run out of energy and then just fall down like a brick, which is super dangerous. And it'll also pretty much destroy everything when it hits the ground. My original plan was to have a parachute that it would deploy when it topped out. But if you think about it, this thing is gonna be spinning and doing who knows what. It's Hard to imagine the parachute not getting tangled up and everything, and it still slamming into the ground just with a parachute wrapped around it. But I really wanted this to work. I went pretty far down the rabbit hole of a pyrotechnically deployed parachute, basically shooting the parachute out of a cannon so it gets really far away from the blades quickly, but you can still imagine scenarios where it wouldn't work. Like if it was tumbling and it shot it straight down, the helicopter would just fall into the parachute. So I decided to go with another strategy, which is a lot harder than the parachute, but I think it could work. Let's go back to our fuel tank analogy. It takes energy to make the propeller go up, but this process works in reverse. When the helicopter tops out and runs out of energy, you can reverse the angle of the blades and the air blowing past them as the helicopter descends will spin them like a windmill, which refills our kinetic energy fuel tank. And then right before we hit the ground, we could change the angle of the blades back to normal, which generates downward thrust with the energy we just stored up, which slows the helicopter down so that it can land. The downside is that it's hard to do, and we have to make blades that can change their angle. And I didn't come up with this. It's called an auto rotation, and it's what real helicopters do if their engine goes out. In theory, we can now land it, but unfortunately the design still doesn't work. So the flywheel is gonna be trying to turn the blades like this, but there's an equal and opposite reaction that's gonna to try to spin the flywheel this way. But that won't actually happen because the flywheel is gonna be acting like a gyroscope. Basically, when you spin something really fast, it resists any changes to its orientation. So there'll be a torque trying to twist the flywheel, but it's going to resist. This seems like a good thing because we want the blades to spin, not the flywheel. But the fact that we're trying to spin the flywheel and it's resisting will make something very non-intuitive happen that is easier to show than explain. So I made this little thing with a motor spinning a flywheel. 
It's sort of like a mini version of the helicopter with a flywheel sticking out of the side. So I'm gonna spin the flywheel up and watch what happens when I try to turn it. Trying to twist it this way results in a torque that twists it this way. And I'm not gonna get into the specifics of why this happens, but it's called precession and it's really bad because it'll just make my helicopter flip over and crash. But there's a trick that we can do. If we put a second flywheel on the other side of the helicopter, spinning in the opposite direction, it'll process in the opposite direction and cancel out the twisting on the helicopter. The last big question is how to connect the flywheels to the propeller. I decided to use gears, but they're kind of weird because the flywheels are at a 90 degree angle to the propeller. And here's how they work. Imagine you have the shaft for the flywheel and the propeller. And then you draw two imaginary lines to where they intersect. Then you make two cones going from that point to each shaft. The cones will touch, and if one spins, so does the other one. If we looked at this from the side, it would look something like this. Then, if we delete the tips of the cones and add some gear teeth, we have the gears that we're gonna make. These are called bevel gears, and I need them to be very light. So I have to make them myself and every other part of the helicopter. So let's do it. The gears start as a blank cut out on the water jet. Then they go into the five axis CNC, which can turn the part in any direction, which makes parts like this a lot easier. Here's the newborn gear before his teeth came in. I'm using a special cutter with the shape of the gear tooth in it to cut each tooth one at a time. That turned out a lot better than I was expecting. It's pretty much the same process for the flywheels, but overall I just had to turn on the tunes and crank out a bunch of parts because unfortunately the entire helicopter is metal. I'm pretty sure I used every metal working machine in my shop on this. And now the fun part, putting it all together and seeing it not work. Oh yeah, I waited so long to see this thing spin. Finally, all the parts are made. I got them put together and it looks really cool. The most important thing is the rotor head and the blades, which are on a pivot so we can change their angle by pushing and pulling on them. And this is kind of tricky because we have to be able to do it while they're spinning. The secret is this little servo on the bottom which is stationary when the blades are spinning, but it has a little control rod that goes up through the main shaft and can push and pull on the blades to control their angle. And then the lower part is designed entirely around the bevel gears. They have a five to one ratio, meaning the flywheels will spin five times faster than the blades. And they were tricky to make because they're gonna be spinning up to 24,000 RPM, so they have to be balanced really well. And then the space in the middle holds all the electronics for controlling it, measuring altitude, all that stuff. So I just finished installing all the electronics, but I was looking at the flywheels and it occurred to me that I'm an idiot. Remember how I was excited that the two flywheels will cancel out each other's precession? Do you know what else they cancel out? Their gyroscopic effect as well, which this design depends on. The flywheels spinning the blades forward will make an equal and opposite reaction that spins the body of the helicopter backwards. If I try to fly it, the body's gonna start spinning backwards at a thousand RPM. It's gonna start shedding parts, it's gonna crash. I guarantee it's not gonna work. I have no idea how I missed this. They usually do a demo of this on the first day of physics class. They even talk about it in the physics book I got for my kids when they were babies. I think I just had tunnel vision thinking about precession and didn't look two inches to the right. And the right thing to do would be to redesign this, but we put too much time into this. I think it's time to embrace the sunk cost fallacy. We're gonna let it flow through us and we're gonna transition to a different kind of working called hacking. So here's the plan. Airplanes have these things on their wings called control surfaces, which move like this. When air flows over it, it's redirected, which makes a force that pushes the wing down. If I move this one up and this one down, it'll generate forces like this that will twist the wing. What if we stuck something like this on the bottom of our helicopter? We could use the airflow from the blades to twist the wing and keep the body from spinning. Let's find out. And I know this is ugly and just kind of bolted on, but remember, we're hacking. Here it is all together, and the airflow from the blades will go down over these control surfaces and hopefully generate enough torque to keep things from spinning. And I'm just gonna gloss over the second wing because it just isn't important right now. But you can probably guess what I'm trying to do. I think we're at the point where we just have to try it. But before we can do that, we need something to get these flywheels spinning really fast. This turned out to be a bit more complicated than I was expecting, and it kind of turned into its own whole project. 
And the result is this dock thing, which the helicopter sits on like this. There's a motor on the side with a special coupling to interface with the flywheel. And then there's a little computer that controls how fast it spins everything up. And it will slowly ramp the flywheels up faster and faster. And when everything's going fast enough, it releases a trigger, which quickly pulls the motor out of the way so the helicopter can fly without hitting anything. It communicates with the helicopter over this little breakaway cable. The little computer tells the helicopter that it's good to fly. And if it's flying autonomously, it'll take off to the heavens or I can start flying it with an RC controller. So it's time to do some testing, but I really don't want to. <laughs> I'm just, I've just been putting it off because I'm too afraid of what's gonna happen. But I came up with a scheme that's relatively safe. I'm gonna have the helicopter held down with these guides. They'll kind of let it fly, but they'll keep it from tipping or doing anything totally crazy. I have it set up so that when I press this button, the helicopter will spin up. And I've got this piece of polycarbonate to cower behind because it just seems like a lot of ways it could violently disassemble itself directly into my face. So let's see what happens. There's something really weird happening here. I can only get it to like 30% of the speed that I want. And even at that level, our motor is completely maxed out. We're melting wires, burning up speed controls. <laughs> My guess is that there's too much friction in the system. So I swapped the bearing grease for light oil, which makes them super low friction, which didn't seem to make a difference. Then I spent ages trying to adjust how the gears fit together, which didn't seem to make a difference. And then I gave up and just got a bigger motor, which didn't seem to make a difference. And then I was thinking maybe the coupling between the motor and the flywheel was binding up. So I redesigned it, but it didn't seem to make a difference. Then I gave up again and got an even bigger motor, which didn't seem to make a difference. And then it finally clicked. It's the flywheels. It's so obvious. I don't know how I didn't see this. So as this little flat part of the flywheel spins around, it's pushing air out of the way. And I just ran the numbers on this and it's astonishing. To spin the flywheels at 20,000 RPM, it should take about 20 horsepower, which is a lot of horsepower. Now that we know the problem, at least, it's pretty easy to fix. I'm sealing them up with a super light heat shrink film. There's no more big flat surface that we're dragging through the air. It's just a smooth cylinder. Think of spinning a paddle wheel in water versus a smooth cylinder. It's way better. So let's see if it works. Three, two, one, liftoff. We have a liftoff. 32 minutes past the hour. Liftoff on a It is finally flying at least an inch, but it's lifting itself under its own weight. Although I can't really test the control surfaces with these retainers. So I'm gonna take those off. We're gonna put on training gear, which is kind of like training wheels for a helicopter. It makes it harder to tip it over. I'm just gonna fly it manually with an RC transmitter. Here we go. Throttle over. Oh no. Man, I am this close to just destroying everything. Thank goodness I have the training gear on there. They are really earning their salary. Let's try a couple more times. Uh. The helicopter's not failing to fly. I'm reversing the pitch of the blades to generate upward thrust and shove it down onto the ground because I can tell it's gonna crash. So I've got the control surfaces pegged all the way trying to turn the helicopter left and they're just being overpowered by the torque trying to spin it right. I don't think there's anything this wing is gonna be able to do. So I think we basically just have to try to make a bigger wing. We're doing the same thing we did before, just long. I think this is about the biggest wing that we're gonna be able to fit into this thing. And longer is better because it's gonna collect more airflow from the blades, which will also be going faster because we're near the blade tips. And it will generate more torque because it has more leverage. I hope this works because pretty much our last chance. So here we go. <laughs> Come on. The more lift you generate, the more it torques the body of the helicopter. So I'm giving it just enough thrust to barely lift the helicopter, which is the best possible case and the wing is still being overpowered by the twist. Man, that sucks. 
I just don't think we're gonna be able to solve this spinning issue without a complete redesign and rebuild. So let's tentatively call this part one, but we're still not done here. I mean, we've flown it, what, six inches? We gotta take this thing out and just go for it. I'll get the wife to come out. Hopefully she'll even be impressed if she doesn't realize how messed up it is. It's midnight right now, so tomorrow. Doing it live. All right, 6 a.m. and I'm riding my bike because I thought it'd be interesting to show you what I do every day. My routine is, I think, the most important thing that I do. It always starts with exercise and it is insane how good this is for my brain. Whew. Once I'm done with that, I sit down and spend 30 minutes learning something new. And it is crazy how much you can learn if you do this consistently. It's how I've picked up a lot of my skills. And it's also why I'm a huge fan of this video's sponsor, Brilliant. Brilliant is a tool that's designed to help you learn technical stuff and it works really well. That's why I've been talking about it for years. It'll take a technical subject like AI and present it as a series of interactive lessons, which have you working with real data and solving actual problems. So you're learning by doing, which is just the best way to learn. And it's so much more than AI. They have literally thousands of lessons across math, science, data analysis, programming, all kinds of stuff. And it'll take these complex subjects where it's hard to know where even to begin and break them down into a series of bite-sized lessons that build one on top of the other, which is really good for learning a bit every day. So you can probably see why I like this so much. And it is shocking how the knowledge compounds. It doesn't feel like you're doing that much day to day, but do it for a month and suddenly you know calculus. It's crazy. So if you wanna learn a bunch of interesting technical stuff that's gonna level up your problem solving abilities or just maybe relearn the math you forgot from school, you should check out Brilliant. You can try it for free for 30 days. Just go to brilliant.org slash stuff made here. You can also click the link in the description or scan the QR code. And you also get 20% off an annual premium subscription. And that's it. Thank you Brilliant for sponsoring this video. And thank you for taking the time to check it out. All right, the time has come to give this thing the beans. So what do you think this thing is gonna do? I think it'll fly up really high and be awesome. That's what you think. That's what I think. And then it'll land and pieces will break off. This pup's gotta fly. Oh, man, I'm nervous. This is a lot of work that's about to be probably destroyed. destroyed. <laughs> yeah. All right, hit it. Man. Baby's purring. Whoa. Watch out! Oh my gosh. Watch out! Watch out. Well, I don't think the training gear really helped. 2.7 pounder. Alright, scale of 1 to 10. With what? 10 being Scale awesome? of 1 to 10. I'd say a 10. <laughs> <laughs> that landing, uh, that's a 10. It was a good landing. I don't know what I'd call it. It was landing. just really satisfying to finally see it go. Yeah. And then such a epic fail. Oh, well, it was a nice try. It was good. It's a nice try. I think I know how to fix it, so part two. Check back in a while. <laughs> <laughs>